It's a great honor to uh, introduce to you Professor Johanna Petrovsky Stern of Northwestern University. And uh, actually, he is the one who is the le legitimate father of the title of our research group. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, both. Uh, uh, both the idea of uh, a cross fertilization and uh, yes, I think this you were the one, right? Who, uh, who brought this into the uh, into the name of the group? And uh, hmm? you said yes, you said. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, after. Uh, having worked on uh, some modern things like uh, the making of the Ukrainian Jew and uh, Lenin's uh, Jewish question, uh, he is now uh, occupied with a project uh, on uh, the pre-modern Jewish state, or uh, the, say the early the early modern Jew uh, uh, state, right? And it's in right. all its uh, uh, in all its material and cultural aspects. And uh, one of these aspects uh, will come to the fore today in his talk, uh, which is entitled, uh, you will find it in the pharmacy, practical Kabbalah and natural medicine in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between 1690 and 1750. Um, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, oh, I would not try to retell what is in the article. I hope everybody got the article and uh, I hope everybody had a chance to read it. Uh, what I will do today, <coughs> I'll try to, to tell you a story, rather informal story, about how and why I came across this subject matter, uh, what it means to me, how I explore it, what are um, textual, contextual, uh, documentary and methodological problems uh, that emerge uh, from within uh, this project and uh, where it leads me to and why. So I'll start with, uh, with a number of things. Now, let, let me remind you that this is, this is an informal uh, presentation, meaning that if you want to in interrupt me at any given moment, do so, please. Um, I would be more than happy to incorporate your questions um, as I talk, and certainly then we'll have uh, more time uh, for the discussion of uh, uh, what actually I'm trying to do, what is in the article, what is in the presentation. So this presentation is, again, uh, is not uh, an illustration to the article which is in front of you. It is rather a uh, uh, thing in and of itself, um, and uh, it points to, to a number of questions rather than gives answers. Uh, so let me start with this. Uh, the, the subject matter that I'm uh, trying to, to look at, um, I call it between science and magic, because um, it really brings us uh, to a, a very interesting uh, dichotomy. We are talking about the subculture of Balei Shem, of the practical Kabbalists who lived in Eastern, uh, cent East Central and Eastern Europe um, approximately between the 1650s and the 1750s. Um, and um, I look at them through two contexts. Uh, one, one context is um, the context of the, pra of, 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 the, of the popular practical and professional medicine, uh, which is exemplified in uh, the figures such as Tobias Cohen, um, who is one of the most uh, illustrious uh, doctors um, in the Jewish world at that particular time. Uh, he was um, in uh, Germany, he was in Italy, and he ended up being a professional doctor um, in Istanbul. Um, he published his famous book, Marse Tuvia, um, in, in Venice in 1706, and this book has been uh, used uh, and abused by many Balei Sham of the early 18th century. So uh, one uh, particular um, context in which I'm placing the Balei Sham uh, in the focus of my research um, is this particular professional medical context. And another is um, what they actually did, uh, the, uh, the practice, the modus operandi of the Baal Shem, and um, I will tell you in a second uh, why and how I decided to work on them, but, um, but certainly when we look at uh, what they do, we, uh, as, as on this page of uh, Hillel Baal Shem's Sefer HaHeshek manuscript, um, we see uh, uh, 
Kabbalistic charms and amulets. So I look at Baal Shem in between uh, the uh, okay, this is me, um, uh, the uh, medical context and the uh, Kabbalistic context. While doing so, I need to talk for a second about uh, my methodological tools. Uh, Moshe, you recognize that I am I'm, uh, borrowing from, certainly for, 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 from your way of representing uh, methodologies. Um, I am not using the model which I think would be quite natural in this particular context, the old model of borrowing. So um, I'm not trying to say that, okay, there are Baal Shem and they borrow from, let's say, medical textbooks um, of the era. Um, I am doing something different. Um, I'm not saying that uh, we are talking about any kind of model that is about one culture taking from another culture, nor do I say uh, that, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, nor I'm saying that one culture borrows from another culture. Once you say that, this old model means that you certainly privilege one culture against another. Uh, uh, for, for example, if we talk about, let's say, Jews borrowing from uh, Polish medical doctors, uh, you need them to say, Jews borrow from Poles, right? So Jews are secondary, Poles are primary, and this is how this model works. I do not use this model, and I do not even want to think about it. I use something different. I say, well, uh, we are talking about a Slavic and Judaic context in which um, Slavs and Jews, uh, Slavs broadly conceived, Jews broadly conceived, um, share certain things. They share uh, uh, certain uh, uh, behavioral patterns, they share certain beliefs, and, and this sharing does not privilege any culture. Uh, certainly, uh, then I have to look at things simulta uh, simultaneously and not um, in the context of uh, uh, diachronic development in which one culture first invents something and then another culture uh, takes it from there. Um, I wanted to use um, a, a, a very inappropriate triple X uh, caricature to illustrate my second methodological point, but I decided it would be too risky to use it in this room, uh, so I decided just to, to use two uh, neutral pictures. Um, we do know that Gershom Shalom uh, privileges uh, what they call the vertical model of the discussion of historical um, uh, 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 of, of historical events um, and, and processes. Um, for instance, when, when Gershom Shalom discusses uh, uh, Hasidism and Kabbalah, uh, um, he looks at the vertical, meaning uh, diachronic contexts, uh, for example, let's say Isaac Luria or Moshe Cardavero, uh, borrowing from, uh, from the Zohar and incorporating Zohar in, in their own writings. So, this vertical means that you go back to history, right? So you, and, and then, let's say, if you talk about Hasidism, you say Hasidim uh, uh, take Lurianic cedar, 16th century cedar uh, prayer book, and they use it in the 18th century. This, this is what I call vertical. I'm not using this model either. Um, rather, I'm using the model um, suggested by cultural historians such as Carl Ginsburg, uh, certainly by uh, the um, uh, analysis school um, of uh, um, Mark Bloch, um, and others, and this model uh, looks at things in their immediate uh, context, uh, which is certainly synchronic rather than diachronic. So I'm saying if we need to discuss Ballet Shem, uh, who were active in the late 18th, early, uh, in the late 17th, early 19th century, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the late 17th, early 18th century, we have to look at them in their proper immediate context. Who were they in conversation with? Uh, whose books did they copied? Who they studied with? Um, and uh, this particular approach uh, really brings me to a number of, of I hope, interesting um, uh, discoveries uh, that allow me to take this violation out of the vertical context and say, well, uh, they have much more in common with the contemporary uh, Polish medical uh, thought and European uh, developments in, in, in pharmacology rather than with, um, uh, with Kabbalah um, as we know it from either Abulafia or from Luria. And my third thing, my, my third methodological approach is about recontextualization. Instead again of, uh, of saying, well, everybody before me, Atkis, Sholem, uh, or other people, uh, looked at uh, uh, Baal Shem, mostly in uh, the context of uh, uh, Jewish mysticism, 
um, and so on. Uh, I'm saying, well, let's place them in the context that they tell us they want to be placed into. And uh, if they are healers, maybe we can look at contemporary healers um, of that particular time and see uh, much more interesting parallels and, and uh, really recontextualize Balashem and see them uh, not as not necessarily as practical Kabbalists, but as something different. So these three approaches, uh, synchronic context, um, recon recontextualization, and uh, the model of uh, cross virtualization the model of sharing, are three things on which I base my, um, uh, my analysis and my further research. Uh, any questions about that? Is everything transparent? OK, so let's move on. Let me remind you that, that the, the uh, geographical context that we are uh, talking about is the Polish-Lithuanian <coughs> Commonwealth, uh, late 18th, early, late 17th, early 18th century, so approximately between the um, 1690s, um, between the 1690s and 1750s. This is the time when um, Polish-Lithuanian <coughs> Commonwealth um, is in its uh, I would not say in, in, in a stage of philosophy, but certainly in, in the situation when its, its geographic expansion is 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 uh, is, is unparalleled, uh, either uh, uh, if we compare the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth with what it had been in the 14th century, or with what it became uh, 50 years later, let's say after the Britishians uh, between 1772 and 1795. So we are talking about quite a huge area. So we have um, on the uh, on that side, we have Poznan uh, on this side, Smolensk uh, on that side, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea. So it's one of the biggest, one of the biggest countries in Europe, uh, geography-wise. And uh, when we talk about Balasham active in this territory, we have to understand them as uh, as being uh, active in all of this territory, but I will mostly um, talk about uh, that particular area. So Podolia and um, uh, Eastern Galicia. Uh, certainly they were Balashem who were active in the region of Poznan and closer to what today is in Germany. I would not go there and one of my claims is that practical Kabbalists of, of my area um, and of uh, my caliber were quite different from uh, the Balashem practical Kabbalists who we see in, um, in Central uh, Europe, especially in Germany and Italy. How did I come across this subject matter? Uh, approximately in 1991, um, I was working with the uh, collection of the recently declassified manuscripts in the Vernadsky National Library uh, of Ukraine, and I came across uh, this very unusual manuscript, which really uh, oh, immediately uh, caught my, my eye. Um, it is uh, the uh, Sefer HaHeshek, uh, about 700 pages of a dense uh, Kabbalistic text. Um, it is dated, it's approximately 1739-1740. Um, uh, the manuscript is written around that time um, by uh, an unknown uh, Kabbalist uh, whose name is, uh, who called himself Hillel Baal Shem. We do not know what his real name was, where is he coming from, and um, where is he going. He does talk uh, in the manuscript about his um, studies um, uh, from, or maybe even with, uh, the Polish doctors um, of, uh, uh, of that particular time, 1730s. Um, he uh, does mention that he studied um, Kabbalah manuscripts and copied uh, profusely Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalistic manuscripts um, in the uh, Batei Midrash and even in Kloisen, um, uh, this uh, Kabbalistic uh, uh, Waspi clubs uh, for Mikubalim, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Kabbalists um, um, and uh, Hasidim, uh, as we call them, uh, small case Hasidim. Um, of the early 18th century. Uh, so he does mention he, these two contexts uh, that I um, uh, referred to at the beginning of, of this conversation, um, which are first uh, the context of uh, uh, contemporary medicine and B, the context of uh, 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 practical Kabbalah, uh, also contemporary practical Kabbalah. Um, 
the manuscript um, uh, brought me to uh, a, a number of uh, uh, further explorations. I decided to look at other manuscripts called Sefer HaKeshek written at that particular time. I realized, I, I do not know why I have to discuss it with, uh, with you probably at a certain point, uh, there are dozens of uh, Kabbalistic manuscripts um, that are certainly not as big as this one uh, that are entitled Sefer HaKeshek. Um, written between the, 17th, uh, the 1650s and the 1750s and circulating between uh, what today is um, Western Germany um, in the West and uh, <coughs> Smolensk um, in, uh, in the East um, and as uh, far north as uh, Gdansk and as, as far south as, uh, as Sicily. So there are many different um, Judaic manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts uh, that are called Sefer HaKeshek uh, that represent this particular trend of practical Kabbalah that we are discussing today. Um, this manuscript is, is unique among them. Um, according to Moshe Rossman, uh, who was uh, perhaps the first to, uh, to identify the manuscript in 1993, if I'm not mistaken, yes, Moshe? 95. 90, 90, 90, 95. 95, okay. Um, the, this is uh, the uh, uh, most extensive uh, manuscript ever written by about Baal Shem, or at least one that, that, that is extant today and came to us. We have uh, nothing uh, longer than that and, and, and nothing more um, insightful in terms of what it allows us to do. And the manuscript allows us not only to discuss books and manuscripts that Hillel copied and used in his uh, Peula, um, uh, but also uh, look into his um, uh, itinerary. He does uh, refer to moments of his own life, to his failures, <coughs> to his ups and downs, uh, to what he actually did um, in uh, the towns of uh, Podolia and Volinia. Uh, what is fascinating, once we open the manuscript, is that we realize that the guy was active between 1731, 1732, and 1740, exactly in the areas where Baal Shem Tov was active. So we are talking about uh, somebody who um, went from, uh, I would say, uh, uh, Mezrich to Olika, from Olika to Rovna, and, and these are exactly the towns that, that uh, will be later uh, mentioned in uh, Shukhei Habesh to praise the Baal Shem Tov that uh, tells the story and the history of the, of the Besht. Um, the manuscript in question, Sefer uh, HaKeshek, uh, is unique also in terms of its amulets. Um, it has uh, a wealth of apotropaic amulets and charms. By apotropaic, I, I mean uh, uh, those that are used for healing purposes, either spiritual or, uh, or physical. And, and these amulets are unparalleled. I looked through <laughs> dozens and dozens of books of, of uh, 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 Slavic, uh, uh, Central European, uh, German, uh, Polish, and Hebrew amulets. I have never seen anything like that. I don't know where he takes his pictures from, and, and they are quite sophisticated and fascinating. Um, now, certainly when we talk about practical Kabbalah uh, manuscripts, we can discuss um, specific books that Hillel uh, Baal Shem and other Baal Shem active in this particular area. We know at least nine of them. Um, uh, plus the Baal Shem Tov, um, uh, used or, uh, or referred to or quoted in their manuscripts and books. Um, however, what is, what is uh, very interesting about Hillel Baal Shem and also about um, other texts that I'll discuss uh, um, in a second is that he is using all the time uh, medical uh, refuot. Not only, uh, you know, sigulot and refuot, uh, those um, amulets and charms um, that um, you would immediately recognize as being uh, taken uh, directly from previous sources, even from, uh, if we uh, look carefully at Gideon Bohak's wonderful book, um, uh, Jewish Magic in Later Antiquity, maybe even uh, from the um, pool of uh, amulets uh, that circulated already in, uh, in Late Antiquity, but they also use uh, and, and, and this I find it's especially important, uh, medical uh, amulets and charms, uh, all sorts of medical uh, reward and sigula. This is one of them, and, and, and again, I can provide thousands. Shilonitel lo davara shishul, afa guf atzur asara yamim, en kan chashash klal, ve achar kach ye asulo hakristir, im chalav ve tsukar, ve chamach, af shayanashim munaot minyan ze, 
וכולי. זה אין להשגיח עליהם כי כן יסד רופא גדול ומומחה וגם רופא גדול ומומחה המונח מורה הרב רבי שמחה דוקטור This is uh, the, the Polish doctor very famous in the uh, 1690s, uh, 1700s וכן כתב הרב הגדול uh, מובהק ומומחה um, מורה הרב רבי uh, יעקב uh, צהלון יעקב צהלון This is um, uh, a very well known Italian doctor David Brudenman uh, wrote uh, extensively about him You should not give your patient any laxatives even if he does not defecate for 10 days. There is no reason to worry. And afterwards you should give him an enema with milk, sugar and butter. It's, it's a wonderful enema. Um, and since women, uh, for, 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 for Russian speakers, enema is klizma. Um, um, and since women resist this treatment of, of, of that disease, you should not treat them. This was the decision of the great expert doctor and also the great doctor and expert, the late Rabbi Simcha doctor, and, and, and so it was written by the great rabbi and expert Yaakov Tzilon, Zahalon of the Blessed Memory. So this kind, th these kinds of, 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 of amulets um, appear on each and every page. <coughs> dozens and dozen, dozens of amulets that, that, that use what we call in, in everyday conversation popular or natural medicine. Um, uh, amulets that, that use um, herbs uh, or um, other ingredients um, of the uh, contemporary uh, uh, pharmacology or uh, medical, uh, used by contemporary uh, pharmacists or, or medical doctors. I'll talk about the importance of this um, in a second. Uh, look at another one. Uh, this is not from Hilo Balshem. This is taken from the um, manuscript, uh, excuse me, from, from the printed book Toldot Adam uh, by uh, Joel Balshem. Uh, known as also uh, Joel uh, Ben Uri Helperen of Zamosh. Um, so we're talking about the same geographic area. Uh, uh, Zamosh is, uh, as you know, uh, about <coughs> 60, uh, 65 miles uh, north, north, west from uh, Lviv, Lviv, Lemberg, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, The, the book is called Toldot Adam. Uh, there are uh, at least uh, three books uh, ascribed to uh, Joel Baal Shem, published at that particular time in Jolkev. Um, and uh, this book is quoted by Hillel Baal Shem um, on a number of occasions in his, in, in, in his manuscript. It's interesting that Hillel Baal Shem not only quotes this book, but also is extremely irritated by the fact that this book is in print. He says, you know, those people in Jolkev, they published all these uh, little books And, and these are all uh, in octavo books, so, 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 uh, small books. And, and uh, now everybody gets the book uh, in his or her hand and, and thinks that, that that's, uh, you can actually become um, a uh, practitioner of Kabbalah, but these people do not understand how really to work, how, how really a Baal Shem should work, and blah, 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 so I would not go into that. The important thing is that um, this book is quoted in the manuscript that I'm working on, and um, uh, The book also has uh, the same type of um, medical uh, amulets or amulets based on natural medicine that we would find in, in other manuscripts circulating um, at the, uh, that particular time. Even if there are many amulets and several physical methods to treat a sickness, for example, if they know several ways of treatment using the amulets and also using the physical medical measures, one is allowed to prescribe all the required amulets and also to apply all the physical treatments since one amulet does not contradict another amulet. And the physical measures do not contradict the application of the amulets, um, while the amulets do not contradict physical treatment and vice versa. So what is he saying here? He says here um, exactly what, what, what I referred to at the beginning. So there are books uh, written by professional doctors, and if you find that these books contain um, material uh, or amulets uh, or any kind of reforts that do work, use them. If you find uh, interesting things in, in perhaps a couple of books, use them. And remember, you can use both. So there is no, um, actually, that he acknowledges in this particular quote, as, 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 I, as I read it, please correct me if I'm wrong, that there is no contradiction between um, contemporary professional medical stuff and uh, traditional uh, Jewish uh, magic Kabbalah uh, and, and so on. And, and he says that not only that there is no contradiction, you can use them both and they would reinforce one another. Uh, once I realized that uh, Baalei Shem uh, 
such as Yoel Valsham, uh, such as uh, the enigmatic <coughs> author of the book uh, Zebach Pesach, published in, in the um, uh, 1720s by the same printing press in Jolkov. Um, uh, and, and, and other manuscripts circulated at that particular time use um, and quote um, different, um, dif different professional medical books, I decided to look into the subject matter. And I asked myself the question, what is going on at that particular time in Poland? Uh, remember, I told you that I will be referring not necessarily to uh, vertical contexts of, Bale, of the Bale Shem, but, but primarily to the um, simultaneous, the synchronic context. And I asked myself the question, what is going on in Poland at that particular time? What kind of books on, on, on uh, popular medicine are published? What kind of ideas circulate? And I realized uh, to, my, uh, to, my, to my really great admiration that, that um, in the 16th and 17th century, um, there were many books on similar things published in Poland. They were mostly in Latin. They were in folio, that is of this format, of the Gemara format. Um, and um, uh, they certainly were not cheap. However, what happened early in the, um, very early in the 18th century, is that Polish doctors um, suddenly switched from Latin to Polish and started to publish not these big books, but in folio books, this and even these big books, uh, with uh, amulets and charms, based on the same uh, natural uh, medical uh, uh, tricks that, that we discussed uh, right now, looking at uh, Hebrew manuscripts and books, and that they use the same language, uh, that they refer to the same um, 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 herbs, um, they uh, talk about the same ingredients, so there is, direct, uh, there is a direct parallel between what you find in this Polish medical books uh, of the early 18th century and Judaic manuscripts. Um, let, me, let me show you this. Um, if you compare, for example, um, what is written on the title page uh, of, uh, of these books, you'll, you'll find this. Mifalot Lokim, uh, 1722, by uh, Jill Balsham says, um, this book um, is uh, published particularly for the dwellers of small towns who do not have doctors. Um, and although th there are doctors in big towns, this book will suit the needs of the poor who cannot afford a doctor. So you cannot afford a doctor, buy the book, and the book will tell you what kind of treatment you need in case of, uh, uh, of this disease and that disease, or if you have uh, you know, uh, an uh, unjustified uh, fare, or if you have uh, a fever, whatever it might happen to you, this book will treat. So it's, it's, it's like compendium, or uh, as they call it in Polish in Pol, in, in, in language, vademecum medicum, uh, that is to say, a, a medical book that you can take with yourself, and it's you know, it's in, in, in octavo. You can put it in the pocket and use it whenever you are, uh, uh, and, and whatever you do. Uh, Compendium medicum, uh, Pol a Polish book published in 1719, and reprinted four times um, um, after 1719. Um, it has, it has a Latin title, but it, it is in Polish. And it says on its title page, uh, this book contains a brief description of diseases, internal and external, male, female, and childhood diseases, their differences, their causes, ways to treat them easily at home, and particularly for those who, for various reasons, cannot afford a doctor. So, so it's, it's really the title page, uh, this title page replicates that one. Also, um, on various methods of preparing vodkas, liquors, simple and complex healing remedies, and, sy and syrups. Contains a home pharmacy in addendum for the general reader so that everybody can have this book at home and will be able to help his brethren. So, functionally, uh, Mifalot Elohim and Compendium Medicum uh, really do the same. Uh, the one does it for uh, the, the uh, Hebrew readers. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very straightforward, very plain Hebrew with lots of words in, in Yiddish and Slavic languages that most people will be able to recognize. And the Polish books does the same uh, thing for its Polish uh, audience. So if there is parallel, how to understand this parallel? What is going on um, if 
Jewish uh, healers, practical Kabbalists, and Polish professional doctors do the same, use the same language, talk about the same know-how, and, and address uh, the audience in the same way. So that, that's the question I'm asking. And uh, once I looked at this question, I realized something extraordinary uh, that fascinates me uh, uh, even today. I realized that all these people uh, use the uh, know-how, which is at that particular point, certainly not a cutting edge anywhere in the uh, circles of, of uh, professional doctors at that particular time. It is not. It is rather outdated, um, but it goes back to one person who is uh, already semi-forgotten in uh, Central Europe at that particular time and even uh, laughed at, but he is treated very, very seriously in Poland. And he's treated seriously both by Poles and Jews. The person is uh, uh, Philippe Theophas Bambast Paracelsus. Uh, Paracelsus is um, a Renaissance doctor and chemist. Um, um, I do not have dates for him, but he was active uh, between the 1780s and, excuse me, the, 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 14, uh, the 1480s and the 1520s. He did travel to East Europe, so he, has, uh, he had encounters with people in Moscovy and um, in, in Poland, uh, and also with uh, Tatars and Turks. He was in, imprisoned uh, at a certain point when he traveled from Moscovy to, to, to Poland and spent some time uh, in, in um, uh, Turkish or Tatar uh, uh, bondage. Then he was released, and um, the legend says that he used, um, um, to a great extent, uh, wisdom of this oriental wisdom that, that he um, learned uh, from uh, the um, uh, Turks or Tatars um, uh, during the time of his bondage. Um, Paracelsus is known as the father founder of uh, yetrochemistry. Um, yetrochemistry, one of the main inventions of Paracelsus, combined medicine, uh, yatros uh, signifying a physician in Greek, and alchemy. Paracelsus divinized nature, underscored the link between science and experiment, and claimed that only a magician can penetrate the secret virtues of nature um, which he called arcana, arcana, or celestial. Um, chemical elements, and Paracelsus considered sulfur, mercury, and salt as the key ones, shaped nature. To correct natural dysfunctions, such as diseases, a physician should use chemistry and be a chemist, a master of the key elements. Although he experimented with mercury, Paracelsus taught that the goal of chemistry was not to find a philosophical stone, but rather to discover and invent new medicine such as essences and elixirs and tinctures. He understood disease as a metabolic disorder, always local and specific. Now, what is interesting here is that all the Polish doctors of the late 17th and early 18th century till the 1750s use Paracelsus and quote him and, and use elements of yetrochemistry in their research. And uh, Paracelsus is also seen at that particular time the father founder of pharmacology. He, this is the guy who says, you need to treat a disease, you need to know chemistry. Um, he was the first to say it in the late uh, 15th century, um, and it was certainly um, um, something quite well established um, in uh, scientific circles uh, by the uh, mid 17th century. But for the Polish doctors, somehow, I don't know why, uh, Polish medical books, uh, books on Polish medical history say this is this unusual case. Um, for them, Paracelsus is. I would say, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Theodor Herzl is for the early Zionists. Uh, so he is really um, a very important and, and um, <coughs> an influential figure. In and it is, century? pardon? In the yes, century? yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And, and, and th that, that's, why, that's why I'm saying that that, that is unusual because um, there are dozens of books on, on the history of ph Polish pharmacology. Pardon? They, they do not mention him, but they use exactly his know-how. Right? And, and you, you, can, you can find many, many different elements of yetrochemistry in, in, in Pajina. All the time he does that. Um, but I'm, 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 I, would, I would be more than happy to, to talk about that. And also, when we look um, at the um, primary sources, um, that's wonderful. We also have to look at the secondary sources. There's a Polish books on the history of medicine. And Polish books on the history of medicine and pharmacology do say 
that when, when, when Paracelsus is semi-forgotten in Europe, when nobody takes him seriously, he is a big name in Poland at that particular time. Okay? Why is this important? Because Paracelsus, as I mentioned, is a father founder of uh, uh, pharmacology uh, broadly conceived. And Ballet, Shem, both in print and in manuscripts, all the time say, if you lack this or that particular <coughs> uh, ingredient, if you do not know where to buy this tincture, if you need this particular um, herb, if you need this particular um, um, uh, you know, belladonna, the chemical element, Timtsa beapotek, or Timtsa etzel harochel. That is to say, go to the pharmacy, where you will find it uh, by a pharmacist. Uh, you will, uh, that what gives uh, the, the title uh, of, of uh, the, the, that's what gives the title to my lecture. You will find it in the pharmacy. This is the buzzword that you will find in um, uh, Sefra Cheshek, in uh, Toldot Adam, in Mifalot Elokim, in Zevach Pesach, uh, in many other books and manuscripts published at that particular time. You will find the same word combination in the books by Polish doctors, in Vademecum Medicum, in Compendium Medicum, uh, in, in, in Medic Domowy, uh, the, the, the house doctor, uh, another Polish book uh, of uh, natural, uh, on natural medicine um, that was published at that particular time. So there is this affinity that someone needs to discuss and ponder. Could you, could you say a bit about who the pharmacists were in Poland? Uh, they were professional pharmacists. They were, um, well, pharmacy in Poland, um, I, I discuss, uh, I believe, seven pages just on pharmacies in Poland at that particular time. Um, they are, uh, in most cases, uh, professionals. That is to say, they, they, they do not just lease a pharmacy uh, uh, from a local... Uh, they studied at uh, a university abroad, normally. Not no? necessarily. Um, I would say uh, you can compare uh, Polish pharmacists to Polish doctors the way we compare uh, let's say uh, Sofrim, Mohalim, um, and uh, Magidim to the rabbis, right? Rabbis have a smicha. Uh, Magidim, uh, let's say Mohalim, and others they do not necessarily have a smicha for rabbanut, right? But they are what, you, what we call secondary intelligentsia. So, so pharmacologists, pharmacists are let's say, secondary intelligentsia in the realm of, um, of, of doctors. They do not necessarily go to the universities, but they did study medicine uh, uh, professionally, and, and they certainly... Um, that's true, that's true, but this is not the question that interests me at that particular time. What interests me at that particular time is that I decided to look at the... at what is available in the pharmacies. If Baleshem and Polish doctors tells us, tell us, uh, uh, you'll find it in the pharmacy. Let's go to the pharmacy. But which pharmacy are you talking about? Okay, hold Polish on a second. Or Jewish? Hold on a second. There are no Jewish pharmacists at the particular time. Are, of course. There are no poly there are no Jewish pharmacists, not a single Jewish pharmacy in uh Have you read Balaban? Okay. There are pharmacies that are, that might be leased by the Jews, but or there, there are there are pharmacists who might be Jewish. Right. I, I, I would I would contradict him. I would contradict him. I, I did not find a, a single um, professional Jewish pharmacist at that particular time in Eastern Poland. That let me put it this way. Okay. Um, uh, whatever is available at Agad at the Archivum Gluli Agdavne in Poland, uh, I looked at it. There is no farm, no living pharmacist that that, that, that escaped my attention. Uh, all of them are uh, either Germans. Or, um, uh, or, or, well, they, most of them are, are of German origin. Some of them are Poles. What I, what I was interested in, I was interested in what is available in the pharmacies. And um, I looked, for instance, at different registers uh, or inventories uh, of, the, um, of the pharmacies. And uh, what I found there, for instance, this is the register of the stock of medicine and remedies at Trojanov Pharmacy. Um, certainly, it's, um, it's, uh, it discusses uh, in, 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 in the Polish language what is available um, on each and every sh uh, shelf uh, of, uh, of the closets uh, and wardrobes that they have uh, uh, in, um, in, in, in this uh, pharmacy in, in Trojanov. Once I started to look at the uh, lists of uh, things they had on the shelves, uh, 
it, it really gave me heebie-jeebies. I, I, was, I was fascinated by what I read because what is available in the pharmacy is exactly the kind of uh, tinctures, elixirs, um, uh, medical remedies, um, uh, natural ingredients that you would find in, uh, in the books of the Bali Shem. So you can say, uh, if you are in the circle of Bali Shem, if you need something, go to the pharmacist. And uh, in, the real, in the realm of the pharmacist, you can say, if you, know, if you want to know how to use it, go to Bali Shem. Because they really share uh, the same kind of stuff. Uh, moreover, uh, this, is, uh, this is a German language um, uh, register, most likely um, from Nieswisch. Uh, it's from, uh, uh, from uh, definitely, definitely from, from, from a, a, a town um, under, owned by, uh, by the Radzivill family. Um, uh, the pharmacist's name is Solomon. Um, well, you might say it's, it's a Jewish name, uh, but, but the, the pharmacist definitely is, is a Christian. Um, so um, here is, uh, you have uh, the um, list of elixirs, uh, tinctures, and other uh, uh, medical uh, things. 100% of the yatrochemical stock, that is to say, this is what Paracelsus would prescribe. And, and he shows uh, how many of them were sold, uh, what is the sum of money uh, uh, that, um, uh, that you pay for each of those, and uh, what is the... Uh, and how much he sold uh, during his year. Again, uh, you look at Trojanov, you look at, uh, uh, at uh, most likely Nieswish, and, and the, the lists are the same. So we are talking about this shared uh, know-how and shared uh, pool of uh, uh, natural uh, stuff. Now, then I ask myself a question, is it only in Poland? Or, is it, or maybe it has something to do with East European uh, uh, medical subculture at that particular time. So I went to uh, Rgada, which is a Russian uh, a state archive of, of, of ancient documents, and I looked at the documents of the late 17th and early um, 18th century um, in, uh, in uh, Slavic languages, mostly in Russian. Um, uh, this kind of document is called uh, uh, Stolpci, so this is uh, the pre pre Petrine uh, kind of a document, you know, Peter the Great. Uh, uh, order that all the documents, all the state documents uh, in all the state institutions should be written in the form of, of the book, like you open it uh, from here to there, right? But at that particular time, uh, late 17th century, so before Peter, uh, they wrote all the documents uh, in this particular way, and they, they, they would glue another document, another document, so and then they, 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 they would uh, uh, wrap them this particular way, so, so you have to... Uh, unwrap them and unroll them and, 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 uh, and, and read what is inside. So again, uh, this particular document would give you the same kind of uh, tinctures, elixirs, herbs, uh, roots, um, and spices that you would see in the Polish document at that period of time. So, so we are talking about the shared culture of natural medicine that characterizes uh, uh, the uh, doctors and medical or, 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 medical or, or, or pharmacists know how uh, late in the 17th, early 18th century. Um, now, uh, this is a couple of, of, of pictures just for you to, to look at. These are uh, museums of, uh, of Polish pharmacy in, uh, in uh, Lviv, Krakow, Warsaw, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, let me jump uh, over a couple of, uh, over a number of issues and, and, and talk for uh, the remaining five minutes um, about something interesting that, that, that um, I still have to, uh, to think about and, and explore. I mentioned that uh, the books on practical Kabbalah that uh, my hero Hillel Balshem was quoting, uh, in most cases are published in, in the town of Zolkov, uh, which, is in, uh, which is in front of you, uh, and uh, published by uh, two uh, famous publishers who were grandsons uh, of the publisher from Amsterdam, Uri Feibusch who relocated in 1691 from Amsterdam to, uh, uh, to Zolkiv for the reasons unknown to me. Why do you go from uh, the wonderful Amsterdam to the middle of nowhere in Zolkiv? But, but okay, whatever were his reasons, we do not know. His grandsons, um, between 1706 and 1730, uh, published perhaps uh, uh, the ninety percent of all the books on practical Kabbalah um, available in East Europe at that particular time, um, and um, again, when uh, 
when you see these people uh, publishing books that, that, that are based on natural medicine, you ask yourself a question, who are these publishers? Why are they doing that? Can we find them? What do, you know, what do we know about them in addition to the fact that they are the grandsons of Uri Fajr Khalivi, this famous you know, Amsterdam publisher uh, who was the founder of Jolkev Printing Press. Jolkev Printing Press uh, has um, a history in and of itself. I would not go into that. But what, what is interesting, um, in this particular case, I did not follow my know-how and my methodology. I followed Moshe Rossman's methodology. And I asked myself the question, well, if you want to know something about uh, these guys, go to the archive and, and, and look in, in the inventory, inventage of uh, uh, Zholkev. Maybe you'll find them there. And I went to, uh, to the archive and I found um, the um, um, reference uh, to uh, to two publishers uh, who lived in Jolke. They lived in this building. Uh, this is building number 10 in the market uh, place um, of Jolke. Uh, most likely uh, they, uh, they lived there uh, late in the 17th, early 18th century. And the inventage mentions something that, 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 that also uh, struck me. Uh, it says that uh, both uh, publishers leased one-third of the house of a person who lived in this particular uh, place in the, market, uh, in the market square and uh, the name of this person who owned the house was Daniel Aptekas, that is to say Daniel the pharmacist. So it's like they are, they are publishing the books on practice Kabbalah referring to, uh, to pharmacy saying Tim Apotek, you'll find it in the pharmacy and, uh, and everybody certainly would go to to the, to the person from who they lease uh, the house and where the printing press is situated um, and, and, and buy uh, medical stuff. So um, again, I don't know what to make out of it, uh, but I found it fascinating that, um, <coughs> that not only uh, the books refer to pharmacists, but, but actually uh, to, 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 to the pharmacy culture, but also the idea of printing these books might somehow be connected to uh, the culture of uh, Polish pharmacists of that particular time. Now, uh, you, you, you will ask me, how about Daniel Aptekas? Is he really a pharmacist? Well, then what do I do with Balaban? Uh, is he really a, a pharmacist? Or he has just the, the nickname of pharmacist? Is he Jewish? Or he, well, most likely he's Jewish, because Why? everybody, because all other people who are, yeah, he lives in this house. <laughs> Another person who lives in this house is Rabbi of Buchach. Without, without the name mentioned. The inventor says, you know, Radio Bucha. I don't know who is the guy. Uh, other two people are, uh, are the two printers. And, and, and then this particular person. So I would say most likely at that particular time, we are not talking about communal s socialist department uh, where you would have a Ukrainian, a Jew, and, and a Russian living under the same roof. We are talking about um, a, a different era. And I do believe that, that most likely this Daniel Aptekas is, um, is Jewish. But what is, what is interesting, um, the, the, um, uh, the inventors of Zolkev, uh, the, the inventory of, of, of all the possessions um, of the uh, owner of this uh, private Polish town, do not mention a Jewish uh, pharmacy there. So they mention the pharmacist, but not the pharmacy um, as something, you know, in front. Okay? Now, why is all of all of the important because I think it it, it emphasizes uh, the um, the idea with which I started the discussion the, the idea of shared values and patterns um, uh, shared know-how shared uh, patterns of behavior shared um, uh, knowledge um, of uh, uh, medicine and magic uh, that characterizes uh, Jews and Slavs uh, or uh, Jewish and Slavic uh, medical subculture of this particular time. I missed three important uh, frames. Uh, maybe we'll get to them uh, if you want me to discuss the documents. Uh, uh, I'll just mention that they have something to do with the uh, Slavic, uh, uh, Slavic incantations um, um, that uh, Baalei Shem were using. Uh, it's, it's about, again, this uh, Slavic Judaic uh, subculture of, of uh, popular magic uh, that I'm ready to discuss. Maybe uh, we'll do it uh, uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes from now. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So I'm done. Uh, 
So let's let's do questions and answers five ten minutes and then we'll have a break, five ten minutes and then we'll continue, right? Yes. Pardon? Yes. Okay. So so what is then the procedure? We have questions and answers now and then we have a response. Or will we do a uh, uh, motion res response right now and then we have questions and answers? Uh, let everybody take a break. Take a break and then to respond. Yes. Then we'll have questions. Okay. Excellent. You'll keep your question. Sure.